so um, I'm Sevan Janyan. You probably know me from uh, other meetings. Um, I'm going to talk about um, this uh, topic of uh, open source and not just gratis binaries. Um, it's basically something I've run into um, many times in the past, like talking to uh, non-technical people or people who use open source software, um, but just maybe just use it as like a form of obtaining free binary software rather than actually doing anything with um, the source code that they have the, the right to have. Um, uh, okay, uh, so how it, uh, this is basically like the precursor to a blog post that I'm going to write uh, for the BCS in the series that um, Richard mentioned earlier on. Um, I think like uh, apart from people who've been around for a very, very long time where the convenience of like a binary software wasn't readily available, the idea of like kind of compiling your software is part of your workflow. Whereas I think for most people specifically uh, from closed operating systems who enter the open source um, ecosystem, the usual expectancy is binary software. Like it's for a, for a Windows user, it's kind of very uncommon for them to take a piece of open source software and it be packaged for Windows uh, in source form. And I think that they kind of carry on into the into the open source world with this mentality of uh, I'm expecting binaries and that's what I'm going to use. And it's kind of very rigid and uh, limiting way of kind of thinking about it because uh, as part of what you have with the, uh, the sources, you can kind of change it and build it in a way that may not be uh, packaged for your operating system. And there's it can be a quite a, a difficult learning curve, like you know, trying to kind of get your uh, dependencies in place before you can actually do what you want to do is a is a pretty pretty uh, big taking, especially if that's if you're not from that background, um, or you know the the operating system that you're using uh, has made kind of uh, gratuitous changes that uh, may not be actually in the piece of software anywhere else. Um, and so you get like these all these like weird di dichotomies that um, end up affecting the person's kind of adopt uh, um, adoption of open source software. So perhaps maybe like um, rather than trying to kind of build up on these like series of problems, um, I'm trying to work out how you can actually raise a awareness of these kind of particular um, pitfalls and maybe instead of kind of trying to plow forward with uh, you know I have this binary or set of binaries and I have to have these set of binaries everywhere um, and kind of trying to build up on these uh, kind of trying to take a step back and realize that, that um, you have these kind of various pitfalls and maybe you kind of need to avoid things rather than trying to kind of plow forward um, specifically uh, kind of a solution to this uh, in the in, in the mainstream is like the adoption of like things like Docker and containerization and uh, of things. Whereas actually, you have the source code. You don't need to do this. Um, and unless you're in a kind of a, a extremely um, niche sector where you need to have that specific binary in all places, you're probably better off um, not going down that route. Um, and like one of the cliches is like at the moment, you know, every time uh, one of the major, like Apple specifically, uh, announces a new um, a, a piece of hardware, people are, are kind of shouting about why can't it take 64 gigabytes of RAM? And well, pr probably because you probably don't need that much uh, uh, to kind of run a modern stack, but it's just because you're kind of caking stuff on top of each other, um, you probably, you think you do. Um, uh, yeah, so I think it, it ends up becoming like on a, in a search of a, a silver bullet. So at the moment, the, cur the current mainstream is um, using containers and um, things like that. And uh, perhaps you don't need to kind of go down this route. Uh, does anybody else kind of have this experience as well? Or are they kind of um, consuming binaries as, as is and trying to avoid compiling any software as at all? Yeah. I think the challenge most people face is compiling almost anything of consequence of sort is a huge time consuming, frustrating, irritating thing that. Yeah. Almost anything. 
you have to build Firefox yourself. That's that's a multi-day effort. Um, I mean, just bootstrapping Rust, right? Yeah, and it's difficult to see my dad getting that done if he wanted to be working with Firefox. Um, for sure. And so what if it was um, maybe not for the home, but uh, as part of your day job? So like uh, you're working on um, a piece of like well, you have a web stack. So rather than actually just consuming the the runtime from your from your distribution. So like the Python that your um, OS distro provides, actually being able to kind of own that stack and building uh, your stack as part. Uh, as part of your kind of pipeline uh, as a workflow. Uh, yeah, I, I guess maybe I should have kind of quantified it as like not so much for the, you know, everybody should be compiling their <laughs> <laughs> new computer, or <laughs> you know what that means. <laughs> Stage of source based distributions, uh, mostly DSP, so uh, because I like to be able to see. Well, now in theory, you can go in and also do the code. I have to admit that I don't concern myself, like in the programmer, for example, with Firefox, to even begin to know all the crap that's in there. Uh, but, uh, but at least I can go in and recognize certain things or get a backtrace if something fails. Or small things. Uh, and that's just a personal sense of uh, comfort, if you will. I mean, I know that even Ken, uh, Ken Thompson once said that, uh, well, you know, I can build a compiler where I get, you know, unless there's a special keyword, it just throws a backdoor into every compiler piece of software. So you never really know, but uh, it's just something about compiling your software feels like it's so I think like one of the things that they got right with the with the Go thing, I think, which kind of goes against the container thing, is you know the the being able to kind of cross compile stuff um, is is fairly trivial. Um, so you don't need to kind of uh, do this dance. Um, but yet still people kind of feel the necessity to kind of go down the containerization route and just kind of build up on the complexity. Um, yeah. There's another example earlier. How big is this one? Uh, I mean, I managed to because I couldn't, I didn't have enough disk space to download. <laughs> <laughs> GCC risk five compiler. It's huge. It takes a surprisingly long time just to get to the source. Well, I mean, you can and then to, the, the, the two longest ones right now are compiled. You can do GCC or, or LOVM. Those yeah. take forever. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I think it's that once you've got the uh, once you've got the actual checkout of the GCC source, on top of that, then you've got to have a multi gigabyte space for the actual object space as well. So, um, Maybe not so much. Okay, so let's say if you're not building your own web browser and you're not building your own tool chain. <laughs> but, but so, that, that, so where first writing do you go? <laughs> yeah, where well, so there's rather. In, in many cases, the people who are writing the code are not the people who are compiling the code. In many cases, if I'm the developer, even if it's the web stack, I want, I want to know that a patchy was built the right way, not that it was built for some guy decided to throw in this extra option and then bring it up to complain and stuff. So that's why you deliver. That's that's why people deliver Docker, I think, because they want to know it was built, and that's how it was shipped. A lot of the enterprises are now building their own Docker containers that, that the enterprise will generate their own. Maybe they're inheriting or something, but they then know in turn that it was built the right way, so they can throw it to the demo and see if it works. So <coughs> and not everybody is able to, to deal with that whole issue. So I read a uh, I read a blog post from uh, somebody else who was kind of talking about this, but in terms of actually just focusing on developers and uh, which camp they actually ended up uh, being. So this is like doing the comparison of like the free software camp and just just pure open source. 
um, and he's talking about like uh, looking at like the the GNU um, the GNU stack, which is even more complicated in terms of like the amount of dependencies that you end up pulling in. So in my case, like I don't have this problem, so that, but I have a bias in that there's a I, there's a framework that just makes it really easy for me. So as long as you ignore the time that it takes to build stuff. Uh, really, you know, building Firefox is going into a directory and running make, and then it just ends up computing all the dependencies and things like that. Um, so maybe perhaps if there was a framework that would kind of ease the burden, but then still, you still have these kind of crazy number of um, dependencies. I mean, besides like the the Rust thing for like Firefox, that you, you have a Node.js dependency, there's like, uh, I I don't know how many run, language runtimes you actually need to build a web browser, but um, it's it's the. Literally, I mean, I see some web package source. I mean, all the times I use package source, ninety-five percent compiles without any problem. Unless you're Occasionally, there'll be a snag, and it's, it's, it's rare. So I mean, I think even a, a source package program like that. Unless you're trying to build Firefox on like Spark or something like that. Unless you're in some hardware that's a little esoteric. Maybe not Spark. Maybe not Spark. 